All right, so I'm Jay Anderson, medical oncologist at our West office. And I spoke, I think, at, the, at this event two years ago. And I love this audience, but you're a challenging audience. And I say this every time because there are people in the audience, as I'm scanning right now, who can get up and give the talk. And there are other people who are just learning the language. So it's hard to give a talk to that huge spectrum. So we have to cover some background information, bring everyone up to speed, and then kind of dive into the new data. My topic is on the optimal duration of anti-hormone therapy in the adjuvant setting. You've heard adjuvant tonight that refers to in the post-operative setting, and it's with curative intent, and we're talking about patients who have hormone receptor positive breast cancer. I always show the slide. I think it's a simple um, slide that conveys a powerful message on the incidence of breast cancer, that one in eight women will get breast cancer in their lifetime. It doesn't really project really well, but this woman here is a survivor with bilateral mastectomies. She gathered seven family and friends and just call it one in eight. So that's huge. You just think of eight women in any, pu in any public venue and think one of them will be affected by this disease, and then think of all the family and friends that are also affected. So a huge, a huge, um, issue that we want to improve upon. This is why tonight's conversation is challenging, because we, we want to decode this. Uh, we're going to go through some historical data, but it, it's a complicated topic, and patients always come into the clinic saying, how long do I have to stay on this pill? You told me it was only five years. Now you're suggesting maybe it's 10 years. How come? And that's because the trials have been very complicated, looking at tamoxifen is one drug we're going to talk about in great detail, and then aromatase inhibitors as well, and how to sequence them, what's the optimal duration, um, and that becomes very complicated when you try and look at all the aggregate data. So again, let's bring everyone up to speed. What are we talking about here? We're talking about estrogen, which comes from the ovaries in premenopausal patients, and then in postmenopausal patients, patients always say to me, what hormones are you talking about? I'm 70 years old. Actually, postmenopausal women still make some hormone, not nearly as much as when they're premenopausal, but via a different pathway. So the adrenal gland, which sits above the kidney, makes androgens or male hormones. Lucy alluded to that about the androgen receptor. And those uh, hormones are then converted in our fat tissue via an enzyme called aromatase to estrogens. So when you're premenopausal, most of your hormones are coming from the ovary. Postmenopausal, you're making some hormone that is still clinically relevant through this pathway. And in the end, we have this estrogen population we're trying to control because that's what can drive the growth of the hormone receptor positive breast cancer. So here's that schema I was referring to. Here's a cancer cell, and here's the estrogen receptor which can enter the cell, bind to the estrogen receptor. I always tell patients that it can talk to the DNA or factory of the cell and tell the cell to grow. So simple terms, fertilizer that we want to block. And again, tamoxifen will bind right here at the estrogen receptor, whereas the aromatase inhibitors cut down the production. So in the end, we're still trying to control the, the estrogen population or concentration within the body. So here are the drugs we're talking about. Tamoxifen can be used in pre- and postmenopausal women. Sometimes women are confused and think it's only for premenopausal. It is effective in postmenopausal as well. Tends to be a little bit... Um, these drugs down here tend to be more effective if you're postmenopausal, but still, tamoxifen is still a very good choice if a woman can't tolerate uh, an aromatase inhibitor. If a woman is postmenopausal, the options are tamoxifen or an aromatase inhibitor. You have to be postmenopausal to be eligible for an aromatase inhibitor, though. And those drugs are listed here, arimidex, anastrozole, every drug has two names to complicate the situation, Femara or letrozole or aromacin exemestane. So those are the drugs we're going to talk about. This is a uh, diagram here that we're talking, the ER positive is the, is the red uh, line, and it shows that um, there are incidences of recurrences typically in the first five years, but there, are, there is a tail of recurrence between years five and 10, more notably if you're ER positive. So that begs the question, should we extend therapy beyond five years to optimize or to maximally reduce the risk of recurrence? So if you go back, there are trials looking at, what about five years? How did we arrive at five years to begin with? Well, they, they compared five years to two years, and they looked at local recurrences and distant recurrence. Distant, recurs, distant recurrence refers to recurrence of the cancer elsewhere in the body, bone, liver, lung, which is then stage four and not curable. So we're trying to prevent that from happening. And they 
in the trials that were done, this trial here as well as others, it showed that if you take the tamoxifen for five years, outcomes are better than two years. So that's why five years became the standard. And it showed that if you take tamoxifen for, for five years, it can reduce the risk of recurrence by approximately 47% and reduces the risk of breast cancer mortality by 29%. So this is why every time in clinic, we're trying to engage the patient in maintaining their, their compliance with a the therapy, which obviously we have to balance with side effects, which we're gonna talk about. And here's a graph that simply reiterates what I uh, referenced, that we can have event rates that can occur beyond year five. So it kind of begs that question, should we extend therapy beyond five years to maximize outcomes? So is 10 better than five? Well, one trial looked at tamoxifen, uh, the NSABP B14 trial, and they did exactly that. They said, let's take women after five years of tamoxifen, randomize them to five more years of tamoxifen or a placebo drug, and let's look at outcomes. And originally, it showed that there was no benefit. There's no benefit in disease-free survival or overall survival. So several years ago when that data came out, we said, okay, five years is the standard. However, subsequent studies were done and they kind of reversed that outcome. And I'll explain why in just a minute. The ATLAS trial and the ADAM trial uh, were two large trials asking the same question, looking at 10 years versus five years. And what they showed was recurrence rates, this is the ATLAS trial, but the ADAM trial had a similar outcome, Recurrence rates were 3.7% uh, lower if you took TAM for 10 versus TAM for 5. TAM is short for tamoxifen. And mortality was reduced by 2.8%. You have to balance that with side effects. We always tell patients there's a higher rate of uterine cancer as one potential side effect with tamoxifen, and that did increase by 1.5% by taking it for five additional years. So overall, this translated to a 25% reduction in the risk of recurrence and a 29% reduction in breast cancer mortality. This, there was a delayed effect, and this is why that first trial did not find the benefit. When women stop at five years and the others continued on for 10, the event rates occurred after the 10th year. So there really was, were no higher event rates between years five and 10. So when you stop at year five, if you, if you stop at year five, you're actually protected for up to five years thereafter. So the higher rates of recurrence uh, were, were shown to be in a delayed fashion after the 10th year. So all of a sudden we have this data. So this is why patients are confused. First we say it's five years, and now we have data showing it's 10 years as being optimal. So what we now know, or what we knew a little while ago, was TAM for five is better than TAM for two. TAM for 10 is better than TAM for five. Actually, initially it was not shown to be that, but subsequently it was shown to be that. Then we have this other whole class of drug, the aromatase inhibitors. How should they sequence, and does that uh, change the optimal duration? So this is a trial uh, that analyzed, actually this is a meta-analysis. So there were several trials that were done looking at AI versus TAM. We're still now talking only five years at this point. And were AIs better than TAM for five years? And they kind of pooled all that data. And here are the schemas. So if a woman took tamoxifen, which is the yellow bar, for five years versus an aromatase inhibitor for five years, is one better than the other? And then they looked at a switch schema where women took TAM for two to three years, and then either continued TAM for the complement of five, or they switched to an aromatase inhibitor for the remainder of the, or the complement of the five years. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna refer to that as a switch strategy where you kind of split the five years versus an upfront AI starting at day one. And here are the trials that are listed here. So this is a, con a conglomerate of data. And let's talk about that first group that either got TAM for five or AI for five. And there was a, about a 4% further reduction in the risk of recurrence in the group that got the AI, the aromatase inhibitor. So I think most oncologists, given that data, would say if you are postmenopausal and AI eligible, let's talk about giving you an AI. Why would we not give our patient the best drug? And the data show, show that the risk of recurrence is 4% improved. Let's look at the group that did a switch strategy. Let's say a woman was premenopausal or perimenopausal when they start the hormone therapy. So they start the TAM. Two to three years later, they're postmenopausal, and then we switch them. Likewise, about a 4% further reduction in the risk of recurrence with a with, with switch strategy. So now we have those two data sets showing that if you get some AI in, if you're eligible, i.e. postmenopausal, in the first five years, outcomes are better, reducing the risk of recurrence by about 4%. 
And I'm going to skip through some slides because my talk is probably going to go over. So that summarizes what I just said. So we already talked about the Adam Atlas trial saying 10 of TAM is better than 10 of 5. Now we know that 5 of an AI is better than 5 of TAM. As long as you get in some AI, whether it's the whole duration or for a switch strategy. But what about beyond five? So now you've taken um, either tamoxifen for five or a switch strategy, and now should you take more therapy beyond your five that may include an aromatase inhibitor? Because we already talked about the, the tamoxifen data showing superiority of 10 versus five. This is where it gets a little complicated. So let's talk about this trial, the MA17 tr trial. The schema is listed here, tamoxifen for five, then randomized to five of letrozole, an aromatase inhibitor, versus a placebo. So asking the question about 10 years versus five, split strategy, TAM for five, AI for five. And it showed a 43% reduction in the risk of recurrence by adding on the five years of letrozole after five of TAM. So that data set, you know, if you're in our clinic and you're approaching your five years on TAM and you now are postmenopausal, we would have said we probably should consider now five years of an, of an aromatase inhibitor given that improved outcome. And the benefit um, occurs to occur annualized. It's not just a benefit taking it for one year and then you're, you've realized the benefit. There was a benefit over the sequential uh, years of therapy of exposure. There was not a difference in overall survival. So we, th we th always throw out these terms, disease-free survival and overall survival. Disease-free survival means uh, essentially no recurrence. Overall survival means was someone living or not. And this study showed that there was a 2% improvement in overall survival, 94% and 96% at four years, but that was not statistically significant. We may have to follow these women for longer periods of time. Remember that delayed effect, so it may require longer than four years of data accumulation to actually detect and finalize whether there is a, whether there is a survival advantage or not. Um, there was a slight increased incidence of new osteoporosis. So one side effect of an aromatase inhibitor we worry about is um, propagation of bone loss. However, in this trial, it was reassuring to know that there was a increased incidence of osteoporosis, but there was no difference in fracture rates between the groups, which is nice to have that reassurance. So this uh, study showed that it lowered the risk of recurrence by 43%, improved four-year disease-free survival by 6%. The overall survival was not significant yet, and it also reduced the incidence of an opposite breast uh, new cancer event. And other trials showed a similar outcome if you use other aromatase inhibitors in replace of the letrozole. Okay, now we're finally up to San Antonio 2016. Okay, so you needed that background to understand the questions these three trials uh, attempted to answer, which can, again, get complicated because they're talking about different sequences uh, with different durations of therapy. So this is the data trial. So hang with me here. I'll walk you through it. Um, this was TAM for two to three years, then they're randomized then to three years of an astrazole or Rimidex, an aromatase inhibitor, versus six years. So the overall exposure is gonna either be um, five to six years with the switch strategy, or eight to nine years switch strategy, okay? And it showed uh, that Three-year disease-free survival was improved numerically from 88% to 90%, favoring the six years, but it was not statistically significant. So in our world, we say that really is not then a true difference. However, we always like to analyze subsets and, and see if there's a little nugget in there buried in that data set. And they said if you analyzed a group of patients who specifically um, were ER positive, and PR positive. Sometimes you can be ER positive, PR negative, for example. But if you look at a group that was ER positive and PR positive and were lymph node positive and had chemotherapy, they actually had a benefit. And they had a 10% improvement in their disease-free survival from 75% to 86%. So again, these are all kind of nuance analyses trying to further hone in on who benefits from extended therapy and who doesn't. At the end of the day, we're on the same team with you guys. We want to treat people optimally, minimize uh, adverse effects, maximize quality of life, and try and guide patients to say, you really 
I think we'll benefit from extended therapy, or I don't think you will, let's stop the therapy. So that's what all this data is trying to, trying to get at. Overall survival, there was no difference. Again, we may have to follow for a longer duration of time to actually tease that out. And you see in this graph, looking at adverse side effects, aches and pains, bones and joints are the big aromatase inhibitor side effect. And the longer you take it, it numerically goes up a bit, not alarmingly, but up a little bit in the incidence. Bone fracture, up a little bit, a few percentage points. Osteoporosis, new onset or osteopenia, also up a few percentage points. And maybe some uh, cardiac event rates. So again, we're trying to balance that benefit with the potential risks. I'm not going to summarize the slide because I think I already did. So this is another, another trial, uh, the NSCBP B42 trial. Similar concept, but different design. This was an AI for five years or a switch strategy. So someone had been on TAM for two to three, then an AI for two to three, or again, an AI for five, now randomize them to letrozole for five or placebo. So now we're looking at an AI for 10, which we had no data on that, even though we have patients in the audience right now who probably at five, six, seven years, we said, yeah, carry on with your AI. I have no data though. So an AI for 10 or a switch strategy with ongoing AI for the complement of 10. And they showed a 15% improvement in seven-year disease-free survival favoring the ongoing therapy. Numerically, it improved from 81% to 84%, but again, not statistically significant. So it kind of begs the question, should we even support that, that recommendation? This is where it gets a little bit complicated on our outcomes. If you talk about breast cancer, let me go back a slide. I can. So here they said there was no difference, but this included uh, recurrence, new breast events, new cancers, death from any cause. So that's not really looking at breast cancer events only, because that includes a kind of a mixed population, and that showed no benefit. But if you narrowed it down to breast cancer events, which is breast cancer recurrence or death from breast cancer, uh, with seven years, there was an improvement in breast cancer free interval um, from 10.6% down to 6.7%, a lesser incidence of events, which was significant. So all of a sudden now we're thinking, oh, maybe there is benefit in a subset of patients if you tease out the data. There was a reduction in the incidence of distant recurrence. We're trying to prevent that from happening, obviously, by 28% favoring the extension of the therapy, which also was significant. So again, kind of different from the prior um, trial we reviewed. There was no difference in overall survival. Again, maybe it was a watered down population with not the right uh, patients being studied, or we have not followed the patients long enough. So this uh, presenter concluded the benefit of letrozole or extended AI therapy on disease-free survival did not reach significance. However, it improved. There was no difference in overall survival. However, it was significant if you looked at breast cancer events specifically and reducing the odds of a distant recurrence. And those are important endpoints that, that get our attention. So this author said, uh, this requires careful assessment of a risk benefit analysis and discussion with the patient. And we should probably not recommend extended hormone therapy that refers to beyond five years, maybe, maybe up to 10 in all patients. We should look at their risk, their tumor size, things that we think are predictive of risk, um, their comorbidities, do, do they tolerate the treatment? Uh, what's their other uh, quality of life and health issues? And then maybe uh, consider genomic classifiers that may better predict who is at higher odds to recur in a delayed fashion and who may benefit from the extended hormone therapy. And we're gonna talk about that in a couple slides here in more detail. This is the final trial I'm gonna go through and it was negative, negative, negative. So I'm gonna do it very quickly. This was another extended schema approach looking at tamoxifen for five, or an AI for five, or a switch strategy. So they kind of took all potential schemas in the first five years, then randomized to ongoing letrozole for two and a half or five, or five more. So kind of a mixed population, different schemas, but again, trying to address the question on, on duration. And there was no difference in disease-free survival in this trial, no difference in overall survival, and the authors concluded, we probably should not be recommending this in all these patients. So now you can see it's a spectrum 
on the data that we saw. That's why if you're confused in clinic, it's because on some level we're confused too. So this is a summary of that data, and I think I just have a couple slides of this uh, speaker who tried to pool the information and recommend what we should be doing in clinic today. And again, what we already knew is that TAM for 10 is better than, better than TAM for 5. AI for 5 is better than TAM for 5. And a switch strategy, including some AI for 5, is better than TAM for 5. So we already knew that. That's kind of review. What we didn't know and what San Antonio kind of attempted to answer is if you have some AI in the first five years, should you take more AI? Whether you had AI for five, should you take more? Or a switch strategy, TAM for two to three, then an AI for the complement uh, for five years, and then more AI. And what they concluded was the benefits appear to be less impressive and or negative based upon the trials we discussed as compared to looking at the TAM for 10, for example, or the TAM for five followed by AI for five. So this begs the question, what's going on here? Maybe the AI benefit is somewhat realized when you already get some exposure to that drug in the first five years, so then the benefit in the following five years or two and a half years is less impressive. And the slight potential benefit must be balanced with baseline risk and tolerance to treatment, and every situation needs to be individualized. This summarizes the comments I already made. So in conclusion, if a patient has had TAM for two or three of the five, um, for a patient after TAM for two, th two or three or five years, then you should consider adding an AI for two to, two to five years thereafter, 2.5 to five years thereafter. However, if they had some AI in the first five years, whether it was for the full five or partial, that's where it gets a little bit tricky because the benefit appears to be less impressive and you have to balance the risks and the tolerance and what we think the baseline risk of the patient is. And here are the side effects. The audience is probably well versed in this. Um, the main differences between tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors are tamoxifen has a higher rate of uterine cancer, blood clots, uh, thrombotic events, cataracts, and the AIs have a higher rate of bone loss, fractures, adverse effect on the lipid profile, um, and ache and pain in the bones and joints. And some patients just tolerate one drug better than the other. And remember, we have three of these available. And even though they're equally effective and their side effects are ne nearly identical in population models, some patients may tolerate option one better than option two or three. So sometimes you kind of go through and try and find the one that, that you tolerate the best. At the end of the day, if you can't tolerate one of these in your postmenopausal, you can certainly go back to TAM, which is a very effective drug, and that 3% benefit of the AI over the TAM is typically realized after about two to three years of exposure. So again, we talk about this all day in clinic, trying to find a balance between optimal duration, reducing the odds of recurrence, and managing um, side effects. So I like this slide because it kind of summarizes what we hear in clinic as a spectrum. I'm glad to be finished with my cancer treatment. I don't want to be reminded any more about my cancer. I want to be done with taking a pill every day. And some women say, I want to do anything and everything to ensure this cancer never comes back and bring it on. So we listen to that, and we try and balance that information with what we think your risk is and your tolerance, and we hopefully we then individualize the plan. A couple more slides, and I promise I'm done. So there are some evolving tools that may guide us as to how to predict who is at higher risk during that delayed fashion or that delayed time frame, years five to 10, and who may benefit from the ongoing therapy. And a couple of uh, assays that are out there um, actually can give us information or insight into risk specifically in years five to 10. The Oncotype test, many are familiar with that, that provides risk over a 10-year period but the um, BCI, Breast Cancer Index, ProSigna, and EndoPredict uh, target more so the time frame between years five and 10. And the BCI, the Breast Cancer Index, is one assay that also gives information about benefit to hormone therapy during years five to 10. So if you order a BCI, you get two tidbits of information. You get prognostic risk between years five and 10. Are you high or low, high or low? and the benefit of therapy between years five and 10, high benefit versus low benefit. And then listed here, 
you can use that information. A clinician can look at information and say, if you are low, low, low risk, low benefit, maybe you stop at five and not go beyond that. If you're high risk, high benefit, probably have more, more motivation to continue the therapy for up to 10 years. And some patients may be a mixed um, input. They may have um, low risk, high benefit, or vice versa. And then the patient and clinician have to kind of navigate that kind of complex picture. But this is an assay that's helpful to help navigate uh, that patient who's trying to decide at the five-year mark, should I continue therapy or can I be done? And final slide, I believe. This is what is potentially on the horizon. We're always trying to improve upon outcomes, and there are new agents and pathways we're exploring that may improve outcomes in the early stage setting, uh, already under exploration, and with some data in the stage four setting. So um, other agents that look at different pathways, the PI3 kinase inhibitors, uh, mTOR inhibitors, um, and CD4-6 inhibitors, which we're already using in the stage four setting. So oftentimes when something's effective in the advanced stage setting, we want to explore it earlier. So stay tuned because those agents may start to become a standard at some point once we have positive data in the early stage setting. I think I'm done. I know that was a whirlwind, but I had to bring everyone up to speed so you know what I'm talking about. And now you can appreciate why you should probably be confused because on some level we are confused, but I think we have a little bit more direction. And ask your doctors about that question. When you show up in clinic and you're at your, if, you're, if you're at your five-year mark, you should ask the, your doctor, what's my benefit? Should I continue therapy and navigate that individualized recommendation?